here, I want to talk for a minute about oral argument. Now, I practice primarily in the state courts of California. I don't do too much federal work. And in the state courts here, everybody has the right to oral argument, unless both sides write up a piece of paper saying, we waive oral argument. That never happens. And my question for you is, from my perception, when I show up to oral argument, justices have already made up their mind. They don't want to hear from me, uh, whichever side of the V I'm on. What is your perspective on oral argument in, in your court system and how, uh, how practitioners like us should approach oral argument? Well, uh, as a great question, Jeff. So when we, let's say in our September term, a lot of times in our September term, we may hit, we typically hear six cases a day and usually maybe four cases, uh, I mean, four days uh, that term. So we'll hear say 24 cases. And so when I prepare and every one of my colleagues prepare we have to go with the idea that that we are tenant. We have our tentative votes based on our pre-argument study, and and I really had never thought of that until I got appointed, Jeff. But the reason for that is if I go to every one of my arguments, and after six cases, then we retire immediately. We don't even have lunch. Just the, in the and everybody will do the same thing. All circuits. We immediately go to a roving room and we immediately sit down, start discussing those cases and voting. And if I show up and say, you know, I, I came with an open mind and so I really haven't decided how I'm gonna uh, vote on any of these cases, I can't get assigned authorship. And that's really, you know, an affront and it's not fair to your colleagues. So, so the unwritten rule is you have to come with a tentative vote. Now, uh, and that sounds very, uh, you know, very much like our minds are made up, but they're really not because you can persuade me. And I have changed my mind a lot, Jeff, in oral argument and particularly because our conferences will oftentimes last two hours or more after the oral arguments. And those typically will, will begin from where the oral arguments left off. And so I may, you may be representing an appellee and I may think, you know, okay, I came in and I've heard myself say this a lot, Jeff. I came into argument thinking that we ought to reverse, but, uh, but you know, the appellee made an argument that I really hadn't, I thought about a little bit, but I don't necessarily think I gave enough consideration to it. Or, you know, he pointed out that in Jones versus Jones, the court had said, this and I really hadn't focused on that part of Jones versus Jones, and even more so than that, Jeff, um, because obviously all all of us and and I, to my knowledge, all circuit courts and probably a lot of most state appellate courts will take it under advisement. Even when we go back, I have I have changed my mind in drafting opinions a number of times. I remember I mentioned one the, which case, but I remember writing one opinion. I'd already uh, completed it. I'd already had all of my clerks editing it. We had checked it for typos. I was reading it one last time before I circulated it to my colleagues and I changed my mind in my very last read. And so I ended up sending my colleagues a, diver a version to affirm and a version to reverse. And I, I, I won't say which one I subscribed to, but I said, I'm gonna go with this opinion. But if you wanna use the other one for a dissent, Go ahead, because I had already written. And so, so, uh, we, so it all came down to the printer, huh? You know, you know, <laughs> and, and, and sometimes we get comments from one of our colleagues, say a dissent. And we all really do try to keep an open mind until the thing is filed. And even then, when we get petitions for rehearing, we try to take a hard look at those. So it it does seem like like probably like all of us have our minds made up and sometimes that is true but sometimes I think I have made my mind up and I end up changing my mind well uh, wow, wow. I, I gotta say I'm, I'm super surprised by that because uh you know certified uh specialists we have to take a lot of extra continuing legal education and I hear a lot of appellate justices speak on this subject and they will sometimes not realize the mic is live or recording and they'll say yeah 
oral argument just doesn't matter or it doesn't matter most of the time. And I'm just, uh, I, I guess I'm heartened to know that all of our rehearsal and practice and showing up to oral argument at least sometimes matters. The client should pay your bill. 